The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. We're in the times of the minor prophets. They called them the minor prophets. I always like to say a minor prophet with a major message because the minor prophets are called that because their books are shorter most of the time than Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel have longer books. And they're called the major prophets. They're the ones that people are most familiar with. But the minor prophets have just as much of a message to tell us, and sometimes even more so of a message to tell us. But all the prophets are, of course, important. In the Hebrew Bible, you don't have the major and the minor prophets like we do, but you just have the prophets. The law and the prophets. Of course, there's Psalms and, and all that. But the Hebrew Bible is like Joel... If we're studying today, Joel, Yoel, the name of God. And it is divided up in our Bible in three chapters. And the Hebrew Bible has it in four chapters. So there's difference if you go into the original language. But the Word of God is still the same. And the title of today's session is God of Judgment and Mercy. He's a God of Judgment and a God of mercy. A lot of people want to present Him as one or the other. He is a God of judgment. He judges. He's a righteous God. He judges sin. He's angry at sin. You read in the Old Testament, God is angry. A lot of times that's what's going on. But He's also a God of mercy. The God of mercy says, yes, I'll judge sin, but I don't want to. I would rather love you than judge you. I'd rather save you than have to see you condemned and lost. We're lost originally, of course, but God wants to save us. And He wants to redeem us. And He cries out. This is the message of the prophets. Whether you have the major prophets or the minor prophets, God is crying out and He's saying, Please come back to me. Please repent. Please turn back to me. And so whether you are in the Old Testament or the New Testament, We may not see as much judgment against sin in the New Testament because we're dealing with grace, we're dealing with doctrine, we're dealing with salvation, the miracles of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit, and there's so much there that you might not see in the Old Testament. But still, God is a God of judgment. He always judges sin. And that's something we need to remember, whether you're talking about the New Testament, whether you're talking about the Old Testament, God always judges sin. Sin never gets by with God. But He doesn't want to judge us for our sin. He wants to save us. And our sin is always judged. Remember that. Even though I just said God doesn't want to judge us for our sin, He'd rather save us. But sin is always judged. It's either judged because we refuse to listen to God and we have to give account of our sin, or it's judged on the cross Christ at Calvary judged our sin. And when we come to Him, we receive His full pardon and forgiveness of our sin. He saves us, and therefore we don't have to go under the condemnation of judgment of sin because our sins are already judged at Calvary. Isn't that wonderful news that when you receive Christ of salvation, you don't have to be judged for your sin anymore because you've already received His redemption. Sacrifice for your sin. Glory be unto God. That is worth a hallelujah because we are definitely redeemed by His blood. Joel has three chapters. In our Bible, it's three chapters. And the central truth is the penitent experience God's mercy. The penitent, those who repent. That's what it means. They experience God's mercy. And I can tell you that from first-hand experience today because... I am one who has repented of my sins, and I've repented many times since I've become a Christian. But I have initially repented of my sins, and I've been forgiven. And of course, to repent since then is just to continue to keep a short account with the Lord and to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. You continue to repent. But you don't repent over and over and over and over just to be initially forgiven. When you ask Him and you believe, You don't have to worry and wonder about whether He's forgiven you or not because you know He has. You know you're forgiven. 
You know you're washed in His blood. And you don't have to wonder about, did He really hear me? Did He really save me? Did He really forgive me? Because you know that you're forgiven. And praise God for that. So the penitent, those who repent of their sins, and they come to Him, they experience God's mercy. There's a verse in James chapter 2, verse 13 that says, For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. For mercy rejoiceth against judgment. If you don't show mercy in this life, you're going to have judgment. And that's what the verse here says. He will have judgment without mercy who has showed no mercy. But mercy rejoices against judgment. The last part of that verse is something we really need to rejoice in because mercy rejoices against judgment. Judgment comes says, you dirty dog, you guilty, you're going to plunge into hell without God. You need to die for your sin. You need to give an account of your sin. You can't face a holy God. And mercy stands up and says, yes, you're right about all that, but I've come to redeem him. I've come to save him. I've come to give him a sacrifice. I've come to ransom him. And I'll give my own body and my own blood for his sins. What a wonderful thing. And he comes to save us. Mercy rejoices against judgment. Our Bible focus, rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. That's Joel chapter 2, verse 13. So you see, even in that verse, even though judgment is coming, and he tells over and over, keeps pounding that hammer, keeps sounding that horn, blowing that horn, judgment is coming, judgment is coming, get right with God, get right with God. And yet in that verse, you see the mercy of God. Rend your heart, not your garment. One of the customs, when they heard bad news, and when tragedy was coming, and something happened to the family, they would tear their clothes. You remember a message that we've heard recently. Don't tear your clothes anymore, right? You remember that message that you hear about in revival that the preacher preaches sometimes? Don't tear your clothes anymore. You don't have to be in despair. You don't have to be exasperated. You don't have to tear your clothes anymore, as it were. And they would do that. They would tear their garments. That's big in the Middle East. And they would, Eastern religion, and even in Christianity, of course, back then was not Christianity, but it was the righteous religion. They would tear their clothes. Something would happen. God says, don't tear your garments. Tear your heart. Let your heart be right with God. Let your heart be broken about sin. Mourn and fast and weep and don't tear your garments. Rend your heart and not your garment and turn to the Lord. Why? Because He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's gracious. And He's plenteous in redemption and mercy. And that's what it says here. Turn to the Lord your God. He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Does He get angry? Yes, He does. But He's a lot slower to anger than we want to think about sometimes. If God were not slow to anger, we would be consumed all right now today already. But He's slow to anger and of great kindness and repents of the evil. When it says that he repents of the evil, it means that he's sorry because of the wickedness, the evil that's going on. He would rather save us than judge us any time. And he's sorry. He's broken hearted because of the ill that's going on in our world today. And because of the fact that we've broken his heart, that we've sinned against God. He's sorry about all this. Call on God. This is what he wants us to do as the book of Joel opens, the first four verses. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, Joel, it means the name of God. He's a son of Pethuel, it means enlarged of God. So the word of the Lord is coming from one who is the name of God, who is the son of one who is enlarged of God. So it's the word coming from God. Hear this. Ye old men, watch out now, he's getting personal. Somebody be meddling a little bit. That's what he says. Listen to this, you old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. And God is talking to all of us then. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? In other words, God is saying, have you heard anything like this? 
Have you seen any time like the time that we're living in? And most of us would have to say, no, I've never seen it this bad. I've never seen it quite like this. I've never seen prices as high as they are. I've never seen men and women as mean as they are. I've never seen things as dirty and nasty as they are. I've never seen things like they are. And God is asking us that. Have you ever seen anything like this? Has this even been in the days and times of your fathers? Have you seen anything like it? He says, tell you your children of it. And let your children tell their children. That's going to the grandchildren. And their children another generation. That's going into the generations following. Into the great grandchildren. Some of us have grandchildren. Some of us even have great grandchildren now. He says, let it go on down. Let's talk about it. Tell them. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. It's just saying that it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse, and what one didn't eat up, the other came along and did. Seems like it has just been a devastation. What one left, the other came and ate it up. And it has gotten worse. Verse 6 says, For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. This is talking about this God has told them, you're going into captivity if you don't get right with God. God allows the enemy to invade the land because of the people's sin. If you don't turn around, if you don't get right with God, you will face judgment. He told them that. And he explicitly tells them, look, all you've got to do to evade, to get away from this judgment, all you have to do is just get right with God. I'm not asking you to do some enormous thing. I'm not asking you to do some impossible thing. All you've got to do is get right with God. And they refused to do it. He invaded the land. The enemy did it affected everything. The trees, the land, the crops, the animals, the people, and even the ministers in the temple. Nothing escaped the awful consequences of this thing. And that's the way it is now. Just look at this thing. Even the righteous people of God, even though we're not living the way the world does, we're in the world but we're not of the world, but yet we're affected by the things that are going on. Because they're so dirty and rotten and stinking and lazy and sinful, we have to put up with some of their mess. And we're affected by the things that are going on around us. We live in a different world. We live in this world, but we live in a world of the kingdom of God. We live by kingdom principles. But we still have to put up with this smut and all this stuff that's going on. And that's the way it was in their day. This day of the Lord, Joel is the first prophet that talks to us about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord, this awful time that's coming. And he tells us, this, what you're experiencing now, Israel, is just a preview of this awful time that's coming upon this earth. Verses 14 and 15. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord, your God. And cry unto the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. And so, he's calling upon the people. And he says, you call upon God. This is your only hope. This is what you have to do. You have to call upon God. And there are several things as we call upon God that he says that we're to do. Sanctify a fast, call a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and the people into the house of the Lord. This is talking about when times get bad and people live more than just skippity do da day. When we need to get right with God and we need to turn around and we need to seek the face of God. And it affects us in such a way that we'll begin to humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and call upon Him and turn from our wicked ways as Second Chronicles 7.14 tells us. And so it affects us in that way when we really need to get a hold of God and we really need to seek the face of God. And that's what this first section talks about. 
call on God and then repent and turn to God. He encourages them. He urges them to repent and turn to God. Chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, shofar, sound that horn, sound it, blow it out, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Blast it out. We need to turn back to God. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And he's telling us again, the day of the Lord, this awful time of judgment is coming. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. This is not a happy time for us. The day of the Lord that we're looking at, that glorious day of the Lord. But the Bible talks about the day of the Lord. It's not a happy time because there are many in this world who will face damnation and judgment. The day of the Lord. Day of darkness and gloominess, thick clouds and darkness, the morning spread upon the mountain, a great people and a strong. There has not been ever the light, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And it's looking again at not only this captivity, not only this Assyrian captivity, not only of this Babylonian captivity that is right here at hand, Israel and Judah, but it's looking to the time of the tribulation. When the day of the Lord will come after the rapture of the church, the day of the Lord, that awful time, and the tribulation comes in on the world, and you talk about people who say, well, I'll just wait till then and get saved, and therefore I don't have anything to worry about. I can live the way I want to live now, and I can wait till then and get saved. But you don't know when then's going to be, and you can't wait till then and get saved. You've got to get saved when the Holy Spirit is dealing with you now, And you've got to come while you have the opportunity now because if you don't come to Jesus Christ now and the day of grace and the free salvation is open to you and you can be saved when God is calling and dealing with you now, when you don't come to Him now, you will not come then when the door of grace is shut and the mark of the beast is offered to you and you can't buy and you can't sell and you can't do anything unless you take that mark. What do you think you're going to do? If you don't receive Jesus Christ now and free salvation, you're not going to receive it then. When you're faced with that time, it says, you have your children, you have your grandchildren here, they're going to starve to death unless you take this mark, you're going to take the mark. And most people, yes, there'll be people saved during the tribulation period. You can read about it. But there'll be multitudes who are not saved during the tribulation period because they're going to receive the mark. They'll think it's just another program from the government coming down the pike. Here's the mark of the beast. Here it is. They'll take it and don't even think anything about it and they'll be lost forever. That's an awful time. And it's coming. It's coming just as sure as we're in this place today. It's coming. I don't know the day. I don't know the hour. But it's coming. And there's something else that's coming before that. The rapture of the church. And Jesus will take us out of here. That's what I'm looking for. Glory to God. This day is coming. And these people that are coming to invade the land... They're strong and they're mighty. They have a rough voice. They have a language you don't understand. Their voice is deep like the sea. And they don't have any mercy. They don't have any mercy on little children and maidens and women. Pregnant women, they'll rip them up. And they did do that. And they have no mercy on the old. They have no mercy on the young. And it's like the time that's coming in the tribulation period when the Antichrist will take over this world and he will... Offer everybody a job. He'll give you a free Cadillac and cell phone, everything to start with. Then in the middle of the tribulation period, he'll drag the rug out from under everybody's feet. Set himself up in the temple like God and say, here I am, you've got to worship me. Here's the mark of the beast. If you want anything to eat, you want anything to buy, you want any gasoline in your car, nitrogen, whatever they're running then, you're going to have to take this mark. If you don't take it, you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't eat, you'll be lost. If you do take it, you can go about your business. You'll be lost. But if you don't take it, you stand for God, you'll probably either have your head cut off or you'll starve to death. That's the choice you're going to have then. And if people don't get right with God now, they're gambling with their soul to wait till then, it don't make any sense whatsoever. You'd be a whole lot better off to play with a pistol on Russian roulette than to gamble with your soul like that. 
A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. It's amazing how when this destruction comes, and this captivity, this enemy invades the land, before them it looks like the garden of Eden. And when they get through, it looks like a desolate wilderness. No wonder he describes it like that which the one left, the other eats up, and when he gets through, it's all eaten up. Caterpillar, locust, canker worm, what one didn't get, the other did. Before the army, it looks like the Garden of Eden, and after they get through, it's a whole lot worse than Grant went through Virginia, I can tell you that. It's a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. He's warning the people. Got to get right with God. Verses 10 to 13. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. You don't want to wait till then to see if you're going to get right with God or not. You need to get right with God now. You don't want to wait till then. And Israel had a preview of it in the captivity that came in their land. They suffered, and they've been suffering for many years. And they still have more suffering to go because they rejected Jesus. They rejected Messiah. They said, let his blood be on us and on our children. The most dumbest thing you could ever say. And his blood is on them and on their children this very day. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. It's a bad, terrible time. And who can abide it? The answer to that is nobody can abide it except for the mercy and grace of God. Therefore also now saith the Lord. Now he's talking now. What can I do now? Now says the Lord. Turn ye even to me with all your hearts. And with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. It's no time to pop bubble gum and be happy go lucky. It's time to get right with God. And of course we can pop our bubble gum now and sing and whistle because we are right with God. But there are many people who are not right with God and it's time to get right with God. Turn to me with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. And rend your heart and not your garments. You can tear your garments. You can sew them up or make more. But when you rend your heart, when your heart gets broken for the loss, and it gets broken over our own sin, it gets broken for the condition of America and the nations of the world, then God can do great and mighty things. Turn unto the Lord. Turn to me. Turn to the Lord your God. For He is gracious, full of grace. That means full of grace. He's merciful. He's full of mercy. Slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth Him of the evil. He'd rather hug you than have to judge you any time. You have kids and grandkids, you spank them when you need to. Wouldn't you rather hug them and love them any time than have to spank them? You spank them and they go away, cry a little bit, and they get all right, and your heart still broke two days later. That's the way it is. And our Heavenly Father, how do you think He feels about us when He has to chastise us? When He has to judge our sin? And I say our sin, people in general, when he has to judge sin, it doesn't make him, ha, 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 man, I'm glad I did that. Boy, you, I, I tell you what, it makes me feel good to do that. God doesn't feel that way about it. Every soul that goes to hell goes to hell over a broken-hearted God and goes to hell over the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for them. Every soul who plunges into hell And I'm a preacher who believes, a teacher who believes that there is a literal burning, fiery, popping, flaming, sizzling hell. I believe this is as hot. Hell is hot and as hot as hell. That's the way I believe it. Hell is hot just as much as heaven is sweet. And hell is real. And I believe that the Bible teaches that people who die without Christ, they go to hell. And they burn forever and ever and ever. But nobody goes to hell that doesn't go over the love and mercy of God. You have to go through the love of God. You have to go through what Jesus did. You have to go through it. And He offers you salvation. He offers eternal life. And He repents of the evil. It makes Him feel bad 
every time someone has to be judged. God has to do it because His holiness demands, His righteousness demands that sin is judged. But every soul that is judged, they go over the compassion and mercy of a holy God. He has to judge sin, but He would rather save than judge any time. And that's why He sent Jesus. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. He loves us and He wants to save us. He wants to correct us. And He does that because He loves us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to see us walk right, talk right, do right, live right, be right. He wants to see us prosper and do good. He wants to see us be in health as our soul prospers. It's not God that's making you sick. It's not God that's putting you down. It's not God that's keeping you down. All that's the work of the evil one. God wants to lift you up. He wants to bless you. He wants to do you good. And if you believe anything other than that, it's not because I say it, but if you believe anything other than that, you've been deluded by the enemy. God wants good things for us. He's a good Heavenly Father. He's a good God. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And He's a Heavenly Father who loves us. And He's made a way that we can be saved. In the third section, God's mercy and judgment. And here we have mercy and judgment. One is on one side, one's on the other. One's to the east and one is the west. One is the north and one is the south. Whatever way you want to describe it, but they're opposites of each other. And the only way that mercy and judgment can be brought together is by the Lord Jesus Christ. Mercy rejoices against judgment. Verse 25, we're still in chapter 2. I will restore to you the years that the locust have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. I will restore to you the years that the locust have eaten. That's what God tells the people. I will restore to you. You've been in times, hard times. You've been judged. You've been chastened. You've been went into captivity. All these things have come upon you. You've been chastened. You've been all these things have happened to you, but I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten and taken away. In verse 28 and 29 and 32, and it shall come to pass afterward. Now this is where the Hebrew Bible goes into chapter 3 because it's actually talking about another thing. After all these bad things, after this captivity, after this restoration and afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. God's spirit is being poured out. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered and it shall be saved. As the book of Acts says it, For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. What a wonderful God we have because He has provided for us a prophecy that deals with the coming outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And we see right here in Joel, Yoel, the name of God, we see Him prophesying of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, it came on the day of Pentecost, and it's been happening ever since. Praise God. Peter said, this is that which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet Joel. And he quotes him. It will come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And what happens when God pours out his spirit upon all flesh? The immediately, it begins to blossom and branch out and spread out. The Holy Ghost came upon them the day of Pentecost. The sound of the rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting and cloven tongues of fire appeared to them and sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues of the Spirit, gave utterance. Immediately they spilled out of that upper room into the streets of Jerusalem. The gospel began to be spread and people began to be saved and born again and people began to be healed and filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's what spiritual revival is all about. God said, I'd rather do that. I'd heap rather do that than to have to judge you because of sin. I'd rather pour the Holy Ghost out on you any time. And so what else happened? Not just that they talked in tongues a little bit. 
Somebody said, oh, you got it, go on about your merry way, and you never hear anything else about it. No, sir, that's some little old slip ways that we've come up with that we have somebody that we might utter a little tongue and we slip them back in the corner somewhere. We're ashamed of the Holy Ghost. We'd rather see entertainment. We'd rather see things in the world that come into the church, but don't talk about the unknown tongue. Don't talk about prophecy. Don't talk about the Holy Ghost. Well, we better talk about the Holy Ghost because the Bible says that in the last days He'd pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters would prophesy. It branches out into the children. It affects the children. The sons and the daughters would prophesy. The old men would dream dreams. You had any dreams lately? Proves you're getting older, doesn't it? I dreamed all night last night. Woke up, went to sleep, dream again. Woke up, went to sleep, dream again. Nothing in the world having to do much with God. Anything I dreamed about God, somebody had me wanting to do something, wanted to ask me to do something, play this, do that, do that, do that, do that. And I'm thinking, man, Lord, have mercy, I'm going to die if I don't wake up. I mean, I'm going to die, work myself to death in my sleep, in my dream. That's the way it is. But he said that old men would dream dreams and the young men would see visions. You can't have Pentecost. Well, we believe in tongues, but we don't believe in all this prophecy. We don't believe in all these dreams and visions. Now, I know some people have dreams and visions that they're just in their own mind. You can tell they're in their own mind because they're a bunch of cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. That's all it is. But the dreams and vision God gives you, it's not cuckoo. It's not hocus pocus stuff. It's real. The dreams and visions he's talking about, if Pentecost is true, if tongues is true, if prophecy is true, all of it's true. Dreams, visions, tongues, prophecy, gifts, healing, all of it has to be true. And it is true. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, will be delivered. This will take place in the remnant whom the Lord will call. God always has a remnant. And He always does. Now it's not just Jew, it's Gentile. Red and yellow, black and white, we're all precious in His sight. In chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, let the heathen be wakened. If you don't want to get right with God, you don't want to have the Holy Ghost, you don't want to see the blessing of God, you want to stay in your sin, live in your sin, He says, let the heathen be wakened. Let them wake up. Let them come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. God is the God of Jehoshaphat because the devil just couldn't think of a name like that. Jehoshaphat means the Lord is judge. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. God is going to judge those who refuse to get right with Him. He has no other choice but to judge them because they refuse to get right with God and they are in a sense judging themselves because they refuse to get right with God. Put you in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe, all right. This is an evil harvest and He's getting ready. Why do we not hear about judgment too much? Why do we see that judgment is maybe not being poured out sometimes like it was in the Old Testament, you say? It's because God is a God of mercy, a God of grace. But the wrath of God is being stored up. And the book of the Revelation, Daniel in the book of the Revelation tells us that His wrath will be poured out without mixture into the earth. And God's Wrath will be poured out upon the ungodly who do not know God. The harvest is ripe. Come, get you down. For the press is full. Can't hold anymore. I don't see how God can take it like He does, but He's God and not me. The vats are overflowing, for their wickedness is great. God will judge wickedness. And He says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And we can see them now, even though that time hasn't come yet. But there are multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Jesus loves every one of them. Jesus died to save every one of them. But if they continue in their sin, they'll be lost without Christ. And they'll spend an eternity in hell. The sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. He's not coming like a little lamb the next time. He's coming like a roaring lion. And he'll roar out of Zion. Utter his voice from Jerusalem. That's where he'll sit to judge the world, to be the king of the world. And the heavens and the earth shall shake 
but the Lord will be the hope of His people. Now this is hope. He's giving us hope here. The Lord will be the hope of His people and the strength of the children of Israel. Verse 20 and 21, But Judah shall dwell forever. He said He'll be the hope of Israel. And that's that Israel, but now He's talking to Judah. He's going to bring them together. The Lord will dwell forever. Judah will dwell forever. And Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. He is still king. And he's still sitting on that throne. And he'll come back to rule and reign on David's throne in Jerusalem. And all nations, all kindreds, all people, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. Glory to God that He is Lord of all to the glory of God. Father, thank You so much for this Word, this wonderful Word from Joel in the Old Testament. causes us to rejoice because we know we're on the winning side. And I thank You, Lord, that even though we haven't chosen You, that You've chosen us. You've allowed us to choose You back. And we've come into the family of God. And You've given us this opportunity to call upon Your name and praise You and thank You. You are a God of judgment, but You're also a God of mercy. And I pray that many would come to you and escape judgment by being born again and celebrating the mercy of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 